Good evening. You're listening to Booked for the Night. I'm your narrator, Melissa Phillips. Tonight I'm reading chapters 29 through 35 of The Jumbies by Tracy Batiste. Enjoy. Chapter 29, Disguised. While everyone in the villages was still cleaning up from the night before, Buki went over to a clothesline behind a house and pulled off a pair of long men's pants. Then he and Malik crossed through some fields to the other side of the island and into their cave. Buki whittled dry coconut husks into sandals with backward feet. Malik put on the long pants. With his sandals on, too, he looked just like a doin'. One last thing, Buki said. He took some dried coconut leaves and wove them into a round hat with a point in the middle for his brother to wear. It was deep enough to cover down to his chin. Malik wanted, walked around with his arms in front of him and whined. You don't need to see anything, Buki explained. I'll be dragging you the whole time. He cut open two fresh coconuts that they had picked up at the beach earlier in the day. He gave one to his brother, and they drank the sweet coconut water and ate the white jelly in silence. It's time to go, Buki said when they had finished. Malik's stomach growled. Nothing else tonight, brother. This is war. There's no time to eat during war. Malik whimpered. Tomorrow those things will be gone and Corinne's father will bring us the biggest fish in this catch. It will be so big it will fill us up for three days. Malik held his stomach and moaned. Would you rather have nothing in your belly for one day or be the thing in a jumbie's belly? Malik dropped his hands to his sides and puffed out his chest. All right then, brother. Let's go. Chapter 30. The Seed Corinne needed to give the brothers time to get ready. She went to her house, hoping to find that something had changed and there was some way to get in and save her father. The vines seemed even more tightly wrapped around the house, so that it was impossible to see anything past them. She circled, looking for some chink that led inside, but there was no visible opening, and as she moved, the vines shifted, as if they were watching her. Corinne left reluctantly and made her way toward the sea. The sky burned orange, her mama's favorite time of day, and for a moment, she remembered her mama's smiling face, and a flicker of happiness lit up inside of her. She wanted to get started. Where were the boys? They needed to hurry. She found a thick grove of coconut trees and hid among them. The tide was in and the waves pushed foamy brine around her, tugging at her hands and feet, trying in vain to pull her into the sea. She felt the last rays of the sun on her skin and the cool water as it lapped her body. A song her mama used to sing drifted into her mind. But Corinne knew that there was no mermaid or whale that would come to help her as they did in her mama's song. If the plan was to work, it was mostly up to her alone. Corinne shoved her hands into her pockets, hoping she had put some fruit in there. But all she came up with was the witch's seed. Only now, instead of just two halves of a seed, there was a little green shoot sprouting from one side and a spiderweb thin root shooting out of the other. Corinne held up her palm to get a better look. She frowned at the little plant that had suddenly appeared. Then she snorted in disgust. The witch's magic was strong enough to make this broken seed grow, but she had still refused to help Corinne fight Severine and the other jumbies. Corinne tossed the plant into the surf. A wave brought it back to her. Papa was right. The sea doesn't keep anything. With the sound of her voice, the plant grew a little more. Before Corinne could take a closer look, another wave pulled the tiny plant back out to sea. Chapter 31, The Boy's Plan Malik stumbled behind Buki in his Dewan costume. Buki parted the bushes and helped his, brother <clears throat> helped his brother through so no one would see them before they had a chance to create their distraction. The scent of freshly baked loaves was strong as they passed the bakery. Malik paused, but Buki shuffled him along. He led Malik past the nearly empty market and edged the road toward a small patch of trees near the dry well across from the mahogany forest. They needed to get close enough to the fishing village so everyone would hear them scream, but far enough to get them all away and give Corinne her chance. Someone small appeared on the bend and walked toward them. When Buki stepped out to greet her, Drew jumped back with surprise. What are you doing here? he asked. I was looking for you. No, you were looking for Corinne, Buki corrected. She isn't with us. She's going to climb the cliff to get her mother's necklace. You let her go? Drew asked. No one can climb that cliff. 
Her hair had been rebraided, and now she unbraided and rebraided the ends of it again. Buki shrugged. Who could stop her? We're here distraction we're her distraction so the fisherman won't get in her way. He waved to Malik, who stepped out from behind the tree. Drew gasped. How did you do this? My ingenuity, Buki said proudly. Malik kicked him. Ow! Well, okay, it was a joint effort. He rubbed his shin. We're going to pretend that I captured my brother back from the Duins. Everyone from the village will come running. That will give her some time to push out to sea. But there are jumbies in the forest, Drew said. What about them? If she makes it to the top of the cliff, won't they come out of the forest to get her? She bit her lip. What else can we do? There are only two of us. I'll do it. I'll make sure nothing will be looking toward the cliff. No one will see her. Alone? How? I'll think of something. She needs my help, Drew said. Even though she's part jumbie, Buki asked, what would your mother say? Drew said nothing. She only unbraided and rebraided her hair. She'll be killed climbing the cliff, said Buki, and you'll be killed going into the forest alone, and we'll be kidnapped by the Duins and never seen again. This is an excellent plan. At least we would have tried, Drew said. Buki smiled with approval and looked at Drew as if he was just seeing her for the first time and liked what he saw. Well, we better get to it then. The sun is nearly gone. The half jumbie will need her distraction too, Buki said. Malik sighed. The smell of warm bread drifted to them on the wind. Buki was sorry that he would never steal from the baker again, and he shuddered to think of what Duans ate for dinner. Chapter 32 Leaving As soon as Drew came back home, her mother ushered her to the bedroom for safety. Drew stood alone in the middle of the sleep mats and blankets as her family moved in the front room, boarding up the windows and doors. It would be dark soon, and the jumbies would return. The hair on Drew's arm stood out. Her fingers felt cold and numb, but she knew she wasn't going to stand there while everyone, even her friends, fought. While the rest of her family secured the front room, Drew changed into one of her brother's shirts and pants. She grabbed some matches and quietly dislodged the two wide floorboards near her mat that she often used to stash things she did not want her siblings to tease her about. She dropped beneath the house, where there was just enough space to lie flat. She crawled out to the side and into the open air. Her heart beat fast. She didn't want to think about what her mother's face would look like when she discovered that her youngest child had disappeared. Chapter 33 Stepping in. The brothers faced the forest. Well, brother, Buki said. He turned to Malik. Malik extended his hand and Buki shook it solemnly. They took one last look at each other and stepped into the trees. Chapter 34. Firewood. Drew clenched a handful of matches in her fist. Her brother's shirt hung to her calves and her braid had snagged on a nail beneath the house and come loose again. She made her way through the sugarcane fields to the edge of the forest. There, she picked up small dry twigs and branches and gathered them in the hem of her shirt. She looked for an opening in the trees and closed her eyes for a moment to steady her nerves before she entered. Drew navigated through the dark forest with the tips of her toes and fingers. Even though her blood pumped loud in her ears, she kept going. She needed to get in as far as she dared so the small fire she planned to set would cause just enough commotion to surprise the jumbies and the villagers. Her legs trembled as she went on. Chapter 35. Nothing. The brothers didn't need to go far into the forest. They stopped at the first line of trees, far enough in that it would look like they had been taken, but close enough to the road to get out fast. As soon as they found a spot to stop, they noticed something strange about the forest. There was no sound or movement around them. It was as if every single creature had disappeared. The sound of nothing at all filled their ears like dry cotton. The brothers strained to hear even the wind in the leaves. Buki sensed that the jumbies were waiting for them to make their move. He looked at his little brother. Malik puffed his chest out to show he was brave and nodded once. Buki held his fist out and counted one, two, and three on his fingers. On the third finger, they both screamed into the night. The forest awakened. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of the Jumbies by Tracy Batiste. 
Thanks for listening and good night.